Hello, everyone. It's Michelle Nypaver. Uh, I'm co-director of Medic. I want to welcome everybody to this grand rounds uh, re-entering emergency medicine on the other side of the COVID-19 curve. Uh, we have a lot of attendees today, and uh, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. We're still uh, having people just sign on, so please be patient with us. Uh, we'll go over a couple hospitality items in just a moment or two. So just give us uh, another, you know, two minutes or so, and then we'll get going. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Michelle Nypaver, and uh, we're about to start our Medic Virtual Grand Rounds today. I want to welcome everyone uh, and thank you for attending. Uh, these have been uh, very helpful uh, events that we've put on, and it's been great to uh, collaborate with everybody around the state. I think we have some uh, interesting speakers and uh, a topic area today, so I wanted to just to welcome everyone. We're going to go through a couple things just to remind everybody how we're going to operate here during the call. Uh, first of all, I just want to just mention that uh, Zoom has a chat function. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end after our speakers, uh, but in the interim, if there is something relevant that you'd like to ask, please put it into chat. Uh, we'll uh, collate those and try to get those into the um, discussion as we move along here, or we will save them to the end. So please use that chat function uh, so we can save time. But uh, again, welcome. So uh, first of all, just a couple of ground rules for this particular event. Uh, again, we want to welcome that all participants, uh, with the exception of the moderator and the presenters, uh, have all been muted for the duration of the presentation. And if you want to ask a question, please record the following in the chat box according to this diagram. Uh, if you haven't used Zoom, there's a chat function. Uh, we would appreciate it when you put a question in that you uh, put your name and facility in there, uh, followed by your question. And then if there's a particular presenter or facility to whom you are directing your question to, please, please note that in the chat function. This will help us uh, get the questions in as we move along or hold them at the end and direct them appropriately. Um, we're going to monitor the chat function. Our medic team is in the background. And, uh, and I'll try to um, be fed some of those questions so we can uh, be efficient with our time. So uh, with that, uh, let's see if we can move along. Um, I want to give you some brief context. I think this is uh, a very interesting time in all of our lives and our facilities uh, and institutions uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we can see that we have an overall uh, rapid trajectory of increased uh, COVID cases throughout Michigan's uh, and as well as uh, daily confirmed cases uh, right up until from the beginning of March until um, April. And uh, it is pretty clear to all of us that uh, this is not business as usual. And as we uh, have now adjusted ourselves and assimilated ourselves into the COVID pandemic, our emergency departments are not operating as usual and our institutions are beginning uh, to think about other activities uh, to be able to go back to some on, um, ongoing uh, medicine as usual. So how we will balance these things uh, is the subject matter of this particular event. So we're delighted that several of us in Medic have been willing to speak a little bit about this today, uh, but this just is a little bit of context for our discussion today. So we are going to be living and working in this era for some period of time, which none of us 
can actually put our uh, specific uh, time frame around yet. So we thought it would be timely to begin to discuss this among ourselves because we are rapidly uh, basically creating a framework for uh, our emergency departments and institutions to operate. And we would love to hear what others around the state are doing uh, and what lessons we can learn and share today. So we have invited some presenters to give us a synopsis, a synopsis of what's happening at their particular site. Um, and I wanna thank them in advance. Uh, from St. Joe uh, Mercy in Ann Arbor, uh, we have Dr. Lee Benjamin, who's the Director of Pediatric Emergency uh, Center and Clinical Operations in the Department of Emergency Medicine. From Hurley, we have uh, Molly Bolton. Uh, she's Assistant Professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of Emergency Medicine. From Beaumont, we have Dr. Kelly Lavasser and Dr. Michael Gratson, representing both the Pediatric Emergency Medicine and Department of Emergency Medicine. From Spectrum Health at Lakeland, we have uh, Dr. Robert Nolan, who is also the Chief Medical Officer and Director of Quality in the Department of Emergency Medicine. From Henry Ford, we have Seth Krupp, who's the Medical Director and Vice Chair of Operations. Uh, and again, I'm Michelle Nypaver, I'm the Medic Co-Director for Pediatrics, and wanna thank everyone. I also wanna put a note in here for each speaker as I call on you, uh, and Dr. Nolan, you'll be first. I just wanna make sure uh, that you uh, please let us know whether you have any disclosures uh, as you begin your discussion along the uh, question set that we have uh, uh, forwarded you in advance, uh, which we will about to be embarked now. So the format will be as follows. Uh, each speaker will get about five to seven minutes uh, for each site to tell us a little bit about your site. Uh, and then we are going to go from speaker to speaker. Uh, site remarks will be uh, focused primarily on ED experience. We recognize all of our institutions and our facilities are doing different things that may impact the ED. So to the extent possible, if you can tell us what the ED is doing in response to that, that would be very helpful. Uh, there'll be about 10 to 15 minutes of some moderated uh, question and answers based on uh, the question solicited via the chat function as well as the survey that was embedded in the invitation. So you can do both of those things. Uh, please note that our call today is being recorded and we will uh, curate the uh, uh, recording and the notes and we will share those publicly. If you have a uh, concern about uh, public uh, 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 dissemination of your particular comments, please let us know that in advance. Uh, so the presenting site outline, uh, each presenting site will provide remarks on several questions that we uh, distributed throughout the Medic uh, email system, and the questions were as follows. We would like to hear from you in terms of what changes in ED operations are planned in your site in response to your health system's opening of other patient care activities. And some of these we've bulleted out as potential effect on triage, how you might be testing differently, how you're gonna manage patient flow, potential COVID versus non-COVID patients, what kind of staffing challenges you might have, PPE allocations, overall facilities, closing, opening, uh, and disposition destinations, which may be new in this particular time period. Uh, we'd like to know whether your site has specific metrics to define when the changes, changes to your ED operations might go into effect. We'd also like to hear from you and what you feel your site's biggest challenge will be in this next phase as we ramp up other patient care activities. Is it coordination of the ED activity in concert with the new system activity? Is it predicting ED volumes and matching your staffing to those uh, ED volumes? How are you gonna manage your PPE stock now that uh, you may have others using it across the health system? Maintaining safety for COVID versus unknown COVID patients during their ED care. How you're managing this uncertainty and these changing operations among your staff to maintain wellness. And whether uh, and how any of us and all of us are gonna ensure that uh, patients feel comfortable coming back to the ED again, uh, because we all know that that's an important uh, part of this whole process. So, um, and then, you know, lastly, we'd all like to learn from whether or not um, several things we've learned during the pandemic were interpreted such that they were successes, that you might permanently keep these in your ED operations. We'd love to hear that too. So, um, just recall that the emergency, uh, Michigan Emergency Department Improvement Collaborative, otherwise known as MEDIC, 
uh, is now uh, up to 23 hospitals and remains growing. If you are on this call, and there are several sites that are considering joining Medic on this call, uh, we, are, we are housing a clinical data registry of ED visits around the state. Our coordinating center is here housed at Mich Michigan Medicine, and we are funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan uh, uh, and uh, Blue Care Network. So um, with that, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Nolan. Uh, if you could unmute yourself and start with whether you have any disclosures to uh, relay to us, and I'm going to let you take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm uh, Rob Nolan, uh, Chief Medical Information Officer, Medical Director of uh, Quality uh, out here in Southwest Michigan, and I have no disclosures to make. Um, I'm sure like everyone else with funding the way it is, nobody's paying me to do much of anything else. So uh, we'll go forward with that. A uh, couple things that uh, I'm sure you all have experienced is the volume issues that have been going on. We on the west side of the state have not been impacted anywhere near to the effect of um, the illness that, that you on the east side have. So I, I really, first of all, wanna say uh, congratulations to you all on the east side of the state for the outstanding job you did with the uh, large surge of sick patients. Uh, when we started out, we stood up tents. We thought we were going to have a very large volume of folks and we were modeling to be overrun. Uh, that really never came to fruition. So we ended up scaling back uh, probably about two, two and a half weeks ago, taking down our tents and things along that line. I think like most sites, our biggest challenge has been a very significant drop in volume. We've seen about a 25 to 45% drop in volume across the three emergency departments that we have here in Southwest Michigan. Um, with that, we had to pare back our hours drastically. Uh, one of our hospitals is a rural access hospital that has single coverage, so we could not change the hours on that. Our main hospital at Lakeland St. Joe, um, we have double coverage and we cut back 75% of our hours for double coverage and drop back our APP hours by uh, over 60% in covering that just to uh, try to match the volume. So our challenges going forward on this is really trying to prognosticate what's the volume going to look like and when do we activate um, and try to go back to normal. And we're currently taking a week by week look at this and, and actually have broken it down to day by day where I let my providers know this. It is very challenging. This is not something I expected going into it, managing the financial aspects of all of our caregivers and the impact they have in either reduction of hours or reduction of shifts overall. So that staffing issue has probably been the biggest one for us. We have um, set a goal of basically being two days in a row at 85% of our average where we will start to flex back up in terms of staffing. We have not even come close to that yet, but that's what we're doing for our other two sites that we have uh, double staffing and, and that we've reduced those. Um, disposition destinations have been interesting for us, uh, but we've pretty much got that taken care of with the rapid COVID test. Uh, that's what I think I'm going to go into more is we are now at the point where we are doing a rapid COVID turnaround test for all of our patients that are going to be admitted, all of our level one traumas, all of our cath lab patients, um, and anyone that is going to be dis charged out to a communal living that has um, even the most remote symptoms of, of COVID. So that's helped with our disposition. Uh, if we would have been talking about this a couple weeks ago, that was a real challenge for us, uh, trying to get folks back either into AFCs or into um, nursing home facilities and things along that line. But we've now set up a disposition where all of our patients will be tested going back to that. We are also uh, increasing fairly significantly in working with our county health department in terms of doing screening for either high-risk um, healthcare workers that have have mild symptoms or community members that meet the CDC guidelines. Uh, we have drive-throughs and if, when those are closed, we have a special screening area within all three of our ERs that we can um, screen and send out for the um, batched tests and get those results back in about 24 hours. And so we're seeing a larger increase in the number of testing that we're doing. We're fa staying fairly consistent at about 10% positives uh, for what we have there. Um, the last bit that I think I'll, I'll chat about here is the other issue that we're having is staff wellness. Uh, at the very beginning of this pandemic, we were very, very touched by the outpouring from the community. Uh, we had tons of local restaurants and um, uh, groups that were donating meals and things to the emergency department. Uh, about uh, two to three weeks ago, uh, Spectrum Health 
uh, out of concern for the health of all the workers had decided that the only thing that could come in would be individually wrapped meals, which made it very, very difficult for people to donate or bring in food. And we saw a very significant drop in donations during that time. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now is just fatigue in our staff. The newness is over and they're kind of tired of the new norm of donning and doffing PPE and running around and doing that. So keeping them engaged in a lower volume environment is kind of an interesting challenge and keeping staff wellness uh, up is very, very uh, interesting um, and, and kind of a challenge that we're running into. The uh, operation standpoint that I think has been a real positive out of this with people washing their hands meticulously and um, being very religious about that, we have seen our C. diff rates throughout our entire hospital plummet to almost zero, which has been very nice. Um, the other one that I, I would really get like to get everybody else's opinion on is almost universally everyone has greatly enjoyed the visitor restrictions that have been put into place. They feel that they are much more efficiently able to take care of patients, um, attest to their needs rather than sometimes the chaos that goes in when six or seven family members join them. Uh, that's a discussion that we are now currently having as we go forward to the new normal. How much do we look at restricting uh, visitors in the emergency department before it was pretty much carte blanche. Um, now we are considering uh, continuing with that restriction. And with that, I will yield my time back, Michelle. Thanks, Bob. This is that's awesome. A lot of a lot of very interesting things there that I heard, um, and I appreciate your time. Uh, I don't have any specific questions yet for you, so just stay tuned. Uh, and I want to move on here to Dr. Molly Bolton. Uh, Molly is from Hurley Medical Center, and Molly, if you could start by unmuting yourself, and if you aren't already, and then give us uh, whether or not you have any disclosures to make. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, I don't have any disclosures. And um, so at Hurley, I think uh, we kind of uh, handled some things really well up front uh, with the challenges, and some things were a little bit more difficult. And so I think from a, a triage screening question, we quickly implemented uh, some icons in EPIC that helped us identify patients who had answered yes to some of the screening questions like cough or fever to isolate them early, even right up in triage so that you didn't walk into a room kind of unwittingly and then discover later that, oh yes, they had all of these things and then have to go back out and don the PPE and then come back in and um, risk exposures that way. Um, and then there was another icon for when they were being tested and then a positive or negative icon when that was resulted. So that was something really um, nice that was implemented pretty quickly up front. And the other thing that I think Hurley was able to do pretty quickly up front was conserve our PPE. Uh, they really didn't uh, sort of let it out the door until they had a good plan for re-sterilizing our um, N95s and things like that. So I think that's one of the shortages that a lot of other hospitals had to deal with that, uh, that we didn't because they uh, kind of addressed that right up front. Some of the bigger challenges that we've had have been testing and the downstream implications of that. Uh, testing for us was very slow to arrive. We were sending our stuff to the, to the state for almost the first month, which meant we had like a five to seven day turnaround time. So dealing with that uncertainty was extremely difficult um, with admitted patients, but also we have a fair bit of homeless uh, patients as well as patients uh, that are in AFC homes or nursing homes that couldn't go back to their previous living situations with a pending test result and what to do with those patients was extremely difficult. Um, so we had to sort of flex some of our units for a while. Our CDU, which is normally kind of our chest pain unit, became basically a pending COVID unit. And that, you know, the kind of flexing our spaces was helpful. And we've been able to now flex that back down. It's kind of half of a half COVID unit now and half back to regular operations. In terms of kind of the, the ways we've been flexing up and down, we were fortunate in that uh, we do have a fair bit of PA, PA coverage. Um, and so 
they normally cover kind of a fast track area in the front of the emergency department and we eliminated that as the volumes dropped and were able to reallocate that PA either to the back or a lot of our PAs have actually started to work in our intensive care unit to assist with the really sick patients up there. So it's been a great experience for them and I think will ultimately benefit us to have uh, these PAs that are really well trained in dealing with super sick patients when they ultimately are redistributed back to us. Um, and then in terms of flexing our attending staff, we have eliminated um, one of our shifts. Uh, like we had three pediatric shifts a day and we've dropped down to two. And then we're trying to flex, um, you know, the peds unit often will see, you know, lower acuity adults and stuff. So uh, we've been flexing that way and hope that the volumes are starting to tick back up a little bit, but it's a little bit uh, kind of anxiety provoking for all of us, I think. Uh, we eliminated Halvez, which was an excellent, uh, an excellent thing, and I hope that this stays forever and ever and ever. Um, the visitor restrictions, I agree, in a lot of ways, it has been really helpful. Uh, maybe, maybe we have we have completely eliminated visitors for anybody over the age of 18, and I think probably allowing one is probably a better way because we have a lot of nursing home patients or elderly patients who come in and can't provide any history. So trying to get that over the phone has been uh, difficult, and also with a lot of end of life decisions, it's really uh, difficult to have those kind of conversations via phone. So I think that some of those visitor restrictions have been detrimental, but overall, I think it's been nice to not have those seven or eight people in the room uh, chiming in all the time. One of the other things that we did is they do a daily safety huddle. Dr. Yagi, our um, chair, does a safety huddle for the whole hospital. And it used to be about 40 people would join in. And it was usually somewhere up on the hospital floors that none of us could make it to. But they've started to do it on a Google Hangout. So it's a nice way that once a day at 8 a.m., everybody can get the same amount of the same information about where we are as a hospital, what our bed situation is, uh, what our ICU situation is, kind of a nice uh, update and they have been approaching capacity of uh, of 250 people at these daily meetings. So I think that that's been a great thing for our um, for our hospital. And um, and then I think going forward, our biggest uh, challenge is kind of just trying to figure out how to reopen uh, surgeries and are we going to test or are we just going to uh, assume everybody has it and operate with full PPE? Um, and then we have been testing all our scheduled OBs, but um, Anyway, I think kind of reopening, uh, we ha I don't think we have a hard and fast plan in place and those challenges that we're kind of working for right now. Uh, I think that's it. Thanks, Molly. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Um, okay, Dr. Lee Benjamin, are you available? Excuse me while I, my slide freezes. There you go. Lee, unmute yourself and uh, if you could give us an update on whether uh, you have disclosures. Wonderful. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. I do not have any disclosures. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of our learnings as I learn and we learn from everyone around the uh, the state. Unfortunately, I am working clinically. I had to cover a shift to help out with a colleague, but I would love to share what we've done and, and, and learned so far. Uh, we quickly ramped up our, from an operational standpoint, had our tents up and were screening low risk patients in the tents to basically keep them from contaminating the rest of the emergency department. As that evolved, we were finding that those who were well enough to utilize that were no longer coming to the emergency department. They were going to our drive-through, which we set up with the hospital. Uh, so that has been taken down in the last couple of days. So we are no longer screening through the uh, tents. We are attempting to cohort patients within the ED with some COVID cold zones, uh, as the hospital has been doing. Um, we have had probably the, the most successful portion of this was our relationship with the hospital in developing alternative care processes, uh, creating capacity for patients, uh, and along with the drop in census that many of us are feeling, we haven't had any uh, prolonged patient stays in the emergency department awaiting beds. That's been that's been wonderful. Um, I'd like to go through some of the, the challenges and then what I hope is a win on the other side of this. I think our biggest challenge right now is in reopening the emergency department and developing trust 
within the community, uh, both internally with our primary care providers uh, and externally with the patients themselves that we have a good handle on things. We can keep patients safe in the emergency department and the hospital uh, and bring them back, those patients who really need to, to be in the emergency department. We want them to feel safe uh, coming here. We are screening all patients uh, through a paucity of entrance uh, sites to the hospital. Um, everyone, when they approach the emergency department before they enter, they are screened um, before they even hit registration for a triage and anyone who has any uh, flags, which has opened up pretty widely, gets a mask placed at that time and gets directly bedded in one of our COVID uh, rooms. So our flow has been pretty good. We have altered our staffing patterns and uh, feeling the same struggles as the other two have already mentioned. Uh, as far as one of our other challenges, staff wellness is one that we're, we're working on a lot and that continues to evolve. Some of the things that we've been doing is we have been having not only video meetings for clinical uh, updates and operational updates, but we've been having social webinars. I believe there's one tonight uh, at eight o'clock where people are just going to get together and share what they've been up to, zoom in from wherever they, they may be. We also are generating professionally moderated wellness webinars for the entire medical staff and uh, trying to see if it would be useful to have one specifically for frontline providers and emergency department providers, uh, specifically medical staff. We've developed a, uh, it's now an 80 page resource compendium that we've also put together for uh, the entire medical staff, including the uh, emergency department physicians. I think one of the great challenges is the numerous sources of communication that are coming in and no singular source of truth. So what we're trying to do is take down the barrier of trying to follow which is the latest and greatest, what is the right link to get to, and basically have created a electronic book uh, for people if they're wondering about the CARES Act and, and, and how, how does that fit in, they can go right to it. If they're wondering about uh, child care, uh, it's all in there. If they are worried about uh, wellness or of themselves, their partners, there is a lot on wellness. Uh, we have a personal uh, private coach, rather a PhD uh, psychologist who is uh, offering uh, one to one counseling, they're not really counseling sessions, but coaching sessions to try to help people get through this. So we're trying to do a lot to maintain provider wellness and communication. The one thing that may be a big win for us is we we had already been working on telehealth and we rapidly, rapidly ramped this up. Um, at one point we were doing medical screening examinations through telehealth, we were doing teletriage, and I think potentially the biggest win is um, what's being referred to as EPPE. So uh, the best way I could explain this is internal telehealth. So if I'm sitting at my computer station and I want to check on a patient down the hall, instead of getting out of my station, donning my PPE, going into a room, exposing myself and potentially others, we have video cameras uh, and audio cameras that we can take into the rooms. Uh, I can just push a button from my computer station and I can talk to the patient, update them about labs, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something that I really hope that we continue to use. We're also generating a telehealth outpatient follow-up platform. Uh, we fortunately did not see the, uh, the surge we were expecting, but we have a home oxygen plan for those with no risk factors uh, who we suspect are COVID to go home on oxygen with a video platform for follow-up, also something to be leveraged post-COVID for other things that we routinely would be admitting. So that's about it. Uh, Lee, before I let you go, uh, there was a question on chat that they were wondering what platform you're using for telehealth. Uh, I am not the best person to, uh, to answer that. I can get back to you. One of our um, providers has been working on this for a, a couple of years and I know has been looking at multiple platforms. Uh, I'm not sure if it's an internal one that we are generating and standing up or whether we are using a, uh, a third party vendor, but I'd be happy to let you know what we're doing with that. Hey Lee, this is uh, Kent. Just want to let you know that it's the InTouch platform. It's a third party. So the, the InTouch is the one we're using internally for, for telehealth. 
Um, it yeah, was the question right. the internal or was the question regarding external telehealth? But Kent's absolutely right. In touch is the vendor that we're using in the emergency department. It's it's pretty slick. Uh, even I can troubleshoot it, and it's been super helpful in not having to go back into rooms. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. We're all struggling with these things, internal communication and trying to limit our PPE and touches on the patient. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate your time, Lee. Uh, from Beaumont, uh, we have Dr. Kelly Lavasser and Michael Gratson, uh, and I'm going to turn that over to you. Just uh, if you could start by introducing yourselves. Uh, Kelly, we'll start with you first and just let us know if you have any disclosures. Kelly, are you there? Uh, Michael Gratson, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Um, I'm, yeah, sorry, Kelly Lavasser may just be having some technical issues, but um, uh, happy to jump in here. So my name is Michael Gratson, emergency physician at Beaumont uh, Royal Oak. Uh, specifically work uh, more just uh, specifically the adult side of things. So um, hopefully Kelly will be able to jump on and uh, add anything that may be specific to the pediatric side of things. But just to jump in this, and I have no uh, disclosures as well. Um, just to jump into things here. So, you know, some of the uh, unique, uh, I think, ED operations that uh, this uh, pandemic has kind of uh, allowed us to really put forward um, was, you know, initially uh, working in southeastern Michigan, we, we did kind of see a, a large uptick in the just the amount of uh, COVID patients that we were seeing. But what was really kind of unique and somewhat fascinating was the decline of just everything else, um, you know, starting toward the beginning of April and then up until maybe about a week and a half ago, it really felt like almost everything we were seeing was coronavirus and then just nothing of anything else. So, you know, the appendicitis, uh, heart attacks, strokes just seemed to disappear entirely. Um, so as the uh, number of coronavirus cases has just dropped precipitously, um, we have started to see some of our kind of classic bread and butter ER stuff uh, start to come back, but unfortunately not at the volume that we were seeing before. It's still a very restricted volume. I believe our, uh, our census numbers are we're down 65% of our typical volume um, across all of April. Um, so that has led to us, uh, unfortunately, needing to um, uh, make some uh, staffing uh, changes uh, with reducing the number of uh, clinical hours that um, our, our attending staff has been working. Um, nurses and APPs are essentially using, uh, also working reduced hours, but using a, a bank uh, a PTO that they had accrued uh, as a way to keep themselves whole. Um, you know, our plan is tentatively is to continue on with this staffing strategy for at least the next two months. But, you know, hopefully as things start to reopen, you know, the confidence within the uh, public starts to return, we'll be able to add more shifts back as the volume demands that. Um, I, what's uh, one of the things that we've been working at to try to, you know, just encourage, you know, those, those emergencies, which are likely just staying home, is we've uh, kind of started to, to develop um, just this past week this idea of, of like parallel hospitals. Um, so one of the things that we started out with this week was we're stationing uh, essentially starting at like 6 a.m. in the morning and then all the way to midnight um, an APP uh, that is basically at our front door and we've created two separate entrances. Uh, if you're screening likely corona positive you're going to go through one specific entrance if you're felt to be unlikely to be at risk of uh, having coronavirus, you're gonna go through at a separate entrance. They're being triaged you know, separately from each other and their rooms in the ER are separated from each other as well. Um, and this continues up through the hospital with specific floors being donated, you know, designated coronavirus floors versus other floors that are non-coronavirus floors. So, and that's, that's really what our kind of messaging is out there uh, to our PCPs that refer patients to us to the public at large is we're, we're really working toward instilling uh, that faith that, you know, 
that there's a real fear out there in the community that if you come to the hospital, you know, for your chest pain, um, that you're going to end up c catching coronavirus and, um, you know, have, have a bad outcome because of that. So we're really, you know, emphasizing the fact that this is, these are separate areas. We're keeping staff separate. We're keeping physicians separate, patients separate, and, and doing everything we can to, to create like a parallel hospital um, or sort of model. Um, other things that we have been doing um, that, uh, you know, I, I, I think have been very successful and that, uh, you know, we're going to continue on with is, you know, I think just uh, the allocation and uh, emphasis on PPE um, is something that we've really worked very hard on over the last month to make sure that we have on time uh, allocations and correct allocations of PPE uh, across the entire hospital system, uh, which has been very beneficial. Um, in addition to this, I think another a really great thing that we got off the ground pretty early on, which was our, our curbside testing, um, which in the first few weeks, we were seeing upwards to 200 to 300 patients a day through there, which was really just incredible. And, you know, I think that, you know, not once we get out of the, the coronavirus times of things, um, maybe something that if we had a really bad flu season, uh, you know, or other other types of uh, potential infectious etiologies where people may just need tests. This is something that I think we could easily roll back out and, and would be very effective. And it was actually a way that early on we were able to generate, you know, increased revenue as, and bill for these visits. Um, the, uh, I think the biggest challenge is going forward with all of this, though, is that uh, is, is really just going to be from the monetary side of how do we, you know, adequately run and staff our department with just the, you know, severely reduced volumes that we're seeing. Um, hopefully this is a temporary thing, but we've already had to kind of make some drastic cuts to uh, our staffing model. So I think that's something that we're just going to be paying very close attention to. And, and hopefully that's only going to be a temporary thing. So um, if Kelly is on, uh, I'll, I'll pass things over to you. Um, or if not, then I'm happy uh, to see the rest of my time. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate your time. Kelly, can you hear me? Are you on? Kelly, if you are and you can hear me, maybe just unmuting yourself. I can hear some background noise, so. Um, what we'll do is we'll come back to you, Kelly. I, I, I can I can hear some noise, but I can't hear any voice. So uh, we'll just come back to you in a few minutes. Uh, we'll go ahead and if Seth, if you are on, um, we're going to move along to Henry Ford, and then we'll come back to Dr. Levaster from Beaumont. So uh, Seth Krupp is a medical director, again, vice chair of operations. Seth, can you hear me? I can. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Can you start with your disclosure, please? I have nothing to disclose. Um, I serve as the medical director and vice chair of operations at uh, main campus and serve uh, as vice chair on the system level. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can, go ahead. Okay, all right, just got a message, my internet stopped working, okay. Um, and so I, I just, you know, I don't want to echo too much the experiences of other places. I think, uh, you know, Beaumont's experience has been pretty similar to ours. We have a ED volume, you know, huge surge at the beginning. We have a tent that's adjacent to our ER where we split and sort people into separate entrances. And um, that's worked really well for us to keep everybody separated in the ED. Um, and, you know, I think has made patients feel safe. You know, we're struggling with the reopening part. You know, we still have a volume down of about 60%. We've cut senior staff shift. We've cut nursing. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of that to try to right size our staffing. We've closed our urgent care that's in our ED and our pediatric area um, and are shifting those patients into the general population of the more mixed acuity. And, and so now we're looking at, okay, what's our next phase? How do we make our ED look and feel like normal again um, so our patients you know, can feel comfortable that they're not walking into a, a tent that's screaming I'm going to get infected with COVID if they're here for unrelated reasons but you know as we've really looked at it the bottom line is we need the tent for the space to separate 
while the prevalence in, of disease is as high as it still is in our community and the number of patients we're still seeing coming in with COVID-like symptoms. And so we're really looking at everything on a two-week cycle, which is maybe a little higher frequency than we need. Um, but every two weeks, we're just reassessing, do we need the tent? Can we maintain this lesser staffing? Can we eliminate more staffing? And so we're just kind of doing two weeks at a time um, and, and moving one foot in front of the other that way. Um, like other institutions, we are opening up for some kind of, I guess, urgent surgeries, and we're pivoting our drive-through testing to help um, you know, assist our surgical colleagues in COVID screening these patients. Um, Henry Ford has uh, maintained the ability to do in-house testing, which has been a huge help for us here. And they have actually developed the ability to do some stat testing for us with turnaround times of like one and two hours. Um, limited volume, but we're still, you know, struggling with, I think a lot of things that all of my meetings now are about, hey, what do we do with people with three week old positive COVID tests? What do we do with people who everyone doesn't really think they have COVID, but their test is pending and they're waiting to go to the ICU. So trying to navigate that water of maintaining flow inside suspicion of COVID as the prevalence continues to decrease, I think is gonna be one of our biggest challenges, um, especially as our old business comes back and maintaining safety of uh, you know, non-COVID presentations and as our ERs fill back up. So I think that's the job at hand. Um, how to do it is really hard to plan for exactly until we continue to put our toe in the water and see the volumes creep back up. Um, so we're, we're just, like I said, two week iterations of staffing and process and uh, going from there. Thanks Seth, it's awesome. Uh, I'm going to uh, just try to get, uh, see if we can make a connection with Dr. Kelly Lavasser. Kelly, are you on? And I apologize that this is happening. I'm so sorry that uh, it is. Okay, so if Kelly, you can hear me, or uh, Michael, if you're from her site and know if she's having any technical challenges, just reach out to us. We'll try to overcome them while we move into uh, some questions and answer period for our, uh, our guests today. Um, again, use the chat. If you have any questions too, you can put it right in there. Uh, if you have somebody that you'd like to direct those to that has spoken today, please do that. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Keith Coker, who has a couple of questions himself. Uh, Keith, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, so I've obviously been listening in. Uh, I'm the director of Medic, and uh, I'm going to curate and moderate the question and answer period here. We have 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, as Michelle was saying, certainly if there are any questions or comments, please use the chat function and we'll incorporate those. Um, but I'm going to start off. Um, I think in particular, um, listening in, you know, it's clear we've had to radically shift and change, uh, you know, operations uh, on a dime. And I'm curious to hear from the panelists what they think uh, are the major weaknesses that the COVID-19 pandemic exposed, um, particularly related to your ED operations. Um, and how you think you've learned from that experience and maybe applying some of that uh, to the next phase in, um, in our response. Um, so think about that a little bit. Um, if anybody wants to jump in on that question, otherwise I can direct it to somebody. All the speakers are able to unmute themselves, so just make sure you unmute yourself and just identify yourself. Keith, this is uh, Rob Nolan from Lakeland. I, I think probably one of the biggest challenges that we ran into was we got so amped up, especially seeing what was going on on the east side of the state, that in some ways we almost overcompensated and it made it challenging to dial it back towards the reality. Um, and, and I think although we were pretty good at, at being proactive in responding to the decreased volumes and things like that, Part of the challenge was actually meeting that on a true time basis. Um, the 
so many people coming in at the tail end of flu season and not having, you know, the rapid test available to us early on changes to get out to the entire staff of who are we, who are we testing now? What are the new um, requirements that we have? You know, the CDC is making daily changes. We were making daily changes with our institution and trying to keep everybody on the same page. Um, I, I think we did an admirable job, but I also think it showed a, a fairly large weakness overall. Rob, you cut out there in that last part. Uh, if you can just restate that, a fairly large weakness in what? Oh, just a fairly large weakness in trying to get all of your providers, you know, you've got 35, 40 providers, um, making sure that they were all up to date. It, it took us a little while to start posting things regularly. We ended up developing in um, Epic, on your Epic screen, a COVID-19, just quick click point so as we were updating some of the symptomatology and things along that line but it would have been nice to have something uh, like that earlier on it, it just took us a week or two to figure out what's the best way to communicate daily and make sure that people or everybody were up now we've got it down relatively well but it would have been nice to have had that in place prior to this happening thanks Rob any other uh, comments from the panelists on that again what is sort of the weaknesses exposed by COVID especially something that you may be uh, uh, adopting a response to going forward as a result of discovering this? I would say, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, it's gonna be quick. Uh, this is Ken Collinor from Chelsea. Um, one of the interesting kind of dilemmas, and, and I think everybody, uh, uh, or the directors for the ER has kind of noted that uh, with this COVID challenge, we, we kind of became front and center. And a lot of us had other responsibilities within the uh, hospital and the regional response to it. And one of the interesting dilemmas we had um, uh, was who was going to uh, uh, present some kind of communication and uh, ongoing communication with some of the retirement facilities in the area. And it came down to just a group of us making sure that they had appropriate PPE, making sure that they uh, had protocols in place to, to care for their workers. We've got one facility over here that's probably about 30% positive. I know in other parts in Detroit, they're up to 50%. Um, and I, I bet Seth has some other numbers. But I guess the, the interesting thing was is that there was not a mechanism. Uh, we had to kind of invent that mechanism. And I think moving forward, uh, that was one of the areas that I th that hopefully we'll be able to uh, continue to uh, uh, utilize because I think that was actually invaluable, uh, knowing what was coming in and how we were going to uh, uh, place patients back into their facility. Uh, so that was, that was interesting. Thanks, Kent. Uh, I heard maybe another person about to speak too, so. Seth Krupp, but I, you know, I think, one of the, the biggest weaknesses is just having a you know, respiratory pandemic protocol for emergency department conversion. You know, I think we figured it out very quickly, um, but you know, we knew this was coming again in 2009, and I don't think that we were probably as prepared as we could have been. And, and I, frankly, I think we're lucky that the uh, disease isn't more obviously widespread than it was. Uh, because I think without a good physical plant plan in place, um, it, it's got to be really hard to safely care for, for patients and separate them. We we're fortunate that we kind of things worked out really well, but I guess our lesson learned is, you know, the day that we are designing a new emergency department, um, that part of dividing flow of patients for a large widespread pandemic really should be, I think, a, a more of a focus than maybe it has been in the past um, when it comes to emergency department design. Because, you know, I, I think this is, quote unquote, a once in a hundred year thing, but I have a bad feeling that uh, that's, we're probably going to see this again at some point or, and continue to deal with it for now. Thanks, Seth. Any other uh, comments from the other panelists? Keith, I just wanted to just uh, check in to see if Kelly Lavasser ever made it back on. Kelly, are you there? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Keith. 
So I have a, another question for the panelists. Um, and again, you know, if, uh, if the audience has questions, comments, please use the chat. So far, still no additional ones. Um, so one of the things I feel like that I heard a lot from um, all of you, um, some more than others, was the, you know, obviously confronting this uh, drop in, in ED volumes uh, across the board, uh, but, you know, the um, approach to somebody, I think it was Lee Benjamin said, rebuilding trust with the community. Uh, I think uh, Michael Gratson also underscored this as well. And I'm curious if there are additional efforts that are ongoing around um, doing that kind of um, outreach or not. And you may be on, if you're talking, you may be on mute. Um, anybody from, uh, why don't we do Rob Nolan since um, you talked a little bit about some of the community response as well and maybe didn't specifically address this. Um, but any um, sort of plans going forward from Lakeland about addressing, rebuilding uh, trust and demonstrating safety in the ED? You bet. Thank, thanks, Keith. We actually, um, a couple things that we're doing with, at Spectrum Health, part of it is community facing um, with marketing where they're uh, doing a co-marketing strategy of letting uh, the community know that the outpatient clinics are now open and that we are doing elective surgeries. And with that is a discussion of the um, great lengths that we go in terms of screening folks up front and, you know, the uh, PPE and the uh, turnover rooms in terms of cleanliness and things along that line. Um, we have reached out to our primary care folk as well as they're starting to open up their office to let them know that the EDs are more than willing to take any of these patients that are um, decompensated. We've noticed just in this last week, we've had a lot of folks who have foregone care um, and uh, as they show up to their primary care docs, they realize that, that they need more acute care than, than uh, what they can handle there. And so we've really been reaching out uh, the other messaging that we've really done with our residents and our providers is when we get those handoffs to be very thankful to let them know, hey, this is, we're here to serve you and we're here to take care of you. So those three fronts have, have been fairly successful. The last one that we've done, um, and it kind of piggybacks on what we were talking about in the last session, um, we really have developed a very close uh, working relationship with our county health department. You know, we have uh, weekly meetings where we sit down with them and some of the other large healthcare um, FAQs and things along that line to discuss strategies. And this is one of the topics that came up there. And the health department has helped us out in terms of messaging in the communities that the hospitals are, are open and very uh, safe and cognizant of areas uh, uh, that people were worried about, but that they can use now. Thanks, Rob. Um, so there are uh, some chat questions now coming in. Um, there's one here I want to direct. I think actually all of the panelists represent sites with uh, training programs. Uh, there's a question um, from Sandy Veter about uh, for those programs that do have residents, uh, uh, what are you doing with their scheduling? Seth, Seth Krupp and Henry Ford, um, we have basically cut only one of their shifts um, and basically left them as an on-call for anybody who's sick. Uh, we really have not done a lot with their scheduling yet. We're kind of just sitting on our hands to see what happens with volume and uh, being pretty liberal about just sending them home if the ED looks quiet. Um, we're also having some staff who have shifts that have been quote unquote furloughed um, in lieu of working the shift, actually doing a designated teaching shift with formalized education, bedside lectures, things that people don't otherwise have time to do in a clinical environment, even though we're slow, they're still busy enough that they're not stopping to do these formal education activities. So we're trying to bring a little education value, value into the clinical arena that we otherwise don't normally have time for uh, to, to maintain learning. And then obviously, you know, keeping telehealth uh, grand rounds and things like that, trying to keep 
most of our normal business running as best we can. Thanks, Seth. Um, so we have five minutes left. Um, I'm going to begin to wrap up. Um, and I've got a final question for all the panelists that I'd like you to respond to. Um, I am curious if you all can describe um, in sort of you know, a high level way what you think your ED operations looks like in six months. And maybe a sort of example of this, one of the comments from Ben Bassin in the chat is, you know, we've had a lot of uh, really great innovation required as a result of the response to COVID and some really great things that have evolved and sort of how do you keep those things going in that momentum. Um, but what does your ED operations look like in six months? Maybe we'll start with, we'll go in order, starting with uh, Rob Nolan again. So I think probably the, the two biggest, I, I am hoping and, and expecting that we'll get back to our baseline uh, volume. I think probably the biggest changes that we're going to be doing is uh, putting a restriction on the total number of folks that can come in and out as visitors, just knowing that there are communicable diseases out there, safety all the way around. And the other one that we've fallen into, and Lee mentioned this, is that the vast majority of our you know, repeat discussions with patients and things like that, we're now doing um, via telephone and telemedicine. So trying to reduce some of those. Um, I, I think the downside of that, and something that we've all probably been preaching forever prior to this, is that sitting down and, and touching your patient and all that, I think that's going to be a big change. And the way we teach our residents to interact, uh, I think, is, is going to be very different. And that, that's going to, we're going to have to make up on that, that patient um, comfort in, in other ways. Molly Bolton? Um, I think... Uh... I think probably I agree. I think probably there will be some restrictions on visitors going forward. I also think probably looking forward to six months from now, I think we're all going to probably still be in a pretty moderate amount of PPE. I think there'll probably be masks and gloves and eye protection for all patients going forward for a long time. Um, I, I'm optimistic that maybe we have proven that we can flex spaces and um, maybe we can eliminate hall beds permanently, but um, but we'll see. Uh, but I would sure like that to be part of what we do going forward. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think we've also proven that our staff can be flexible working in different areas and kind of, uh, you know, helping each other out when one area is kind of flooded and one area is kind of slow. So I'm hopeful that going forward that that will be kind of a routine thing that, uh, that we do. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Lee Benjamin, six months from now, what does it look like? If you're talking, you're on mute. And it could be that I know Lee, it sounded like was in the middle of a shift. So um, why don't we move to Michael Gratson? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Although, uh, after you said your name, I can't hear you anymore. So I don't know if you're back on mute or if we just lost you. All right, well, I'm gonna pivot to our final panelist, uh, who I know is speaking recently. So Seth Krupp. Hi, um, you know, I think th the big question is what volume looks like. My, my prediction is, it, if I have to predict, is that I think we're going to be back up to 80%, but also lessons learned that we've been able to break through the glass on a lot more vertical care than what I think our providers were ever accustomed to or comfortable uh, delivering and understanding that, you know, not every patient needs a stretcher has been one of the biggest, um, I think, cultural breakthroughs we've we've had and so I'm hoping that we can maintain um, some vertical care in a more robust fashion than we've ever been able to do before um, and you know I, th I think six months from now I think PPE is still going to be a big part of our lives and a, and a big issue um, the last part is is you know maintaining some significant isolation areas I think is going to be one of the other challenges is how many beds do we need to keep for 
potential COVID patients, and that's going to be dictated on prevalence of disease. Uh, so we're, we're trying to think about that. Um, I think those are the big changes we'll be focused on. Great. Thank you, Seth. And thanks to all the panelists. Um, Ms. Del Nipe, I'm going to turn it back to you for the closing. Thanks, Keith. Uh, I just want to thank the panelists again. Um, outstanding. We always learn uh, so many lessons with uh, these conversations. So uh, again, this was a recorded uh, webinar and we will have those um, that distributed on our website uh, and want to thank everyone for attending. If you have any uh, late breaking questions, uh, just put them in chat or send us an email. We're happy to answer them or direct them as needed to our discussants. Again, thank you very much and good luck in your operations as we move in the next two weeks. Appreciate your time.